with a, a song that's new to our congregation. It's an older song. Um, and so just relax um, and we will see how it goes. Maybe. <clears throat> to our God, every word of worship in one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God, sing hallelujah to our God, glory hallelujah is to our God, every praise, every praise to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our started a little bit low, but I'm a little bit nervous because my mother-in-law likes this song, so that's why we're singing it. So if you don't like it, that's her right in the front row. At the end of the service, you give her a kick in the shin. But, all right, now are you relaxed? All right. And which praises belong to God? Every praise. All right, so let's get our, you know, relaxed. Let's, one more time, all right? We'll try. Smile and sing like you mean it.
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for being a guinea pig this morning. But that is the truth. Every praise is to our God. Well, we are glad that you're here this morning. At this time, we're going to invite Jim Brinkman to come, and he is our worship leader this morning. And he has a prop. Just, just for my reminder here, we don't want to forget anything. Good morning, everyone. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good to see you here on this bright and sunny morning. Not 100 degrees. Good time to get out and enjoy God's creation this afternoon. Um, have lots of announcements this morning. Uh, if I can find my notes, um, there's a sign up sheet out in the hallway by the main entrance to the southeast corner. Uh, for American Red Cross coming up September 19th where there is uh, needing some salads and desserts uh, for you to sign up for. Lots of good cooks in this church and so this is your opportunity to help in different uh, ways which includes Circle J which starts this Wednesday the after school program so there's also a sign up sheet for that for snacks uh, there if you can uh, help with that. Maybe you can't help with being there, but you can always help with, with providing snacks or keeping <clears throat> that opportunity in prayer. Um, there will be a trustees meeting uh, immediately after church in the conference room and a deacons meeting in the library. Um, and I make note there will be no youth or uh, evening service tonight. Um, Somebody seems to think they need to go back to school. I can't imagine. Why would No. Looking forward to school starting. That's awesome. So, um, any other announcements that need to be made? Jerry. He's signing up for game time. You're sort of oh. <laughs> just testing him out. I didn't know it was a trick. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, we're going to begin choir practice again. Um, if you've been singing with us in the choir previously, we sure hope you'll come back and enjoy the fun. If you haven't been singing with us and would like to, you love singing uh, praise to God, and like to have a good time, we'd like to invite you to come. Just because when you're singing in the shower, the dog howls and puts his paws over his ears, doesn't mean you can't sing with us. We don't require any special talent or anything, just a love of singing to Christ. So we begin at 6 o'clock. We sing for about an hour. Um, we try to tease Greg White, the pastor, all we can, so we have a good time. We sing, and life is good. We have, and we invite you to come if you'd like to. A fun time is had by all. Singing praises to God. This time, check my bulletin out here. In the right place. Ah. Let's stand and have the right hand of fellowship. day that you've given to us, Lord, and we just thank you for the many blessings that each day brings, uh, and just pray, Lord, that you would just bless these offerings now that are about to be given with a joyful heart, Lord, and uh, just use them to uh, your glory, 
through all the different opportunities we have to share about your love to those around us, Lord. In your son's name I pray. Amen. We're so blessed to have so many people in our congregation who share their talents, whether it be musical or otherwise, with us. Now, if you'd all stand and sing as you're uh, able, we'll sing number 496, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. We'll be singing verses 1 and 3.
us pray. Father God, as we come before you this morning, we come to unite with you, to worship you and celebrate you and praise you and thank you. And we come to encourage one another as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for each one that is here, each family that is represented. We are mindful that there are many that are away this weekend for a variety of reasons. And Father, we just ask that your hand would be upon them. We lift to you Jeff Lanter, Lord, and ask that you continue to be with him, that you give him safety and protection as he serves our nation. We're thankful that Amanda has returned from her trip to Haiti and pray that she was blessed by it and a blessing through it. We pray for Delmer and Sharon as they are away this weekend uh, traveling. We ask that you would encourage them. Lord, this morning we also take time to lift you the family of Barbara Clark, who will be assembling uh, next weekend for her memorial service. And we just pray, Lord God, that your hand would be upon them as they travel and give them encouragement and comfort and peace this day. We do lift to you our college students that are heading back to school. Some are already there. Some are leaving shortly. And we ask that your presence would be with them, that you would guide and direct them and protect them, Lord, from the temptations that they may face while away. And we do pray for other children that are attending school, whether preschool or high school or whatever, Lord, that your hand of protection would be upon them throughout this year, that you would bless and encourage them, that you would give them teachers uh, that have a heart not only uh, to teach them, but a heart for Jesus as well. We thank you for all that you've accomplished already this morning. We thank you for the spirit of unity that you give us. And we pray that you continue to work and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as you're getting comfortable, in just a moment we're going to have our, uh, our scripture reading. Um, but I want to give us a little bit of an introduction of where we've been, or kind of a review of where we've been over the last couple of weeks as we have looked. Oh, thank you. Children may be dismissed for Children's Church. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cutchall. I used to, on my sermon notes, in real big letters on the top, I would put, Dismiss Children for Children's Church. But you know, I just have so much to say today, there wasn't any room. No, just kidding. And we thank Heather so much for her faithfulness in working with them. And if you're interested in being involved with Children's Church, please don't hesitate to let us know. It is a blessing. There you go. All right. Well, we have been looking at the idea of loving the Lord with all our heart and with all our soul so far this month. Uh, the first week we looked at the idea of loving God with all our heart, and we remembered that love was putting the needs of the other person uh, ahead of our own, prioritizing God, making Him first. And it's easy to say it, but it's hard to live it. Um, especially in this world where they say, put yourself first, take care of yourself first, you know. Um, it's so easy to forget God. We talked about how all, uh, when it says love the Lord with all, that all meant complete or every part, that every part was present, and not only present, but every part was working. And we compared that to the difference between coming and sitting in a pew during a church service and actually coming and sitting in a church pew during the service and being engaged, paying attention, listening, uh, taking notes, getting something out of the service, and not only getting something out of it, but giving something to the service. Right? And we talked about how the heart was connected with uh, volitional will or choices. And so the first week, the theme was, or the emphasis was that we need to honor God with all the choices that we make. Uh, and again, it ain't easy. Last week we talked about love the Lord with all your soul. And we began by discussing a word that um, we say all the time or think about or use, but that idea of your. What does it mean when it's talking about your? And we discussed it as understanding that it's a personal word, that it's a possessive word, that it is a present word, and it's a perpetual word. And those are words that um, relate to our relationship with God. That He is my God. Right? He is hopefully your God. And so as we were talking about this passage of Scripture, it's not a blanket you all, but it's a me. 
that I am supposed to love my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. We talked about God as the creator, the owner, and the sustainer. We need to remember that. And we also talked about the soul. And we compared it with some other ideas that we sometimes confuse in Scripture. They use words like life and spirit and soul, and sometimes they're interchangeable, and the ideas get a little bit confused, a little bit muddled. But the idea here in that word of loving God with all our soul, we compared it or contrasted with, with a word, uh, zoe, which means life, like biological life, physiological life, right? And then we talked about, uh, that, was, that was birth, physical birth, you know? Um, we're blessed to have Lincoln here, and we're blessed to have, oh, it's not Elliot. What was the name? Elias. Elias. Oh, I got the first two letters right. Elias here. And we talked about how that was physical birth, that Zoe word. And then we talked about the pneuma, which is spiritual. Spiritual life. Spiritual rebirth, right? But this soul word was kind of in between. And it was suke is the Greek word, and it means human life. What makes us human beings? The distinct character and personality that we had. And so the challenge last week in loving God with all our soul was to let God use every aspect of our personality. If you're a farmer, like Jeff Yarrow back there, the goal is for him to be the best farmer for Jesus that he can be. Steve McClure was a teacher, and now he is a para. He's supposed to be the best teacher or para that he can be. If you're a mom, be the best mom that you can be. If you're a dad, be the best dad that you can be. If you're a nurse, be the best nurse you can be, right? To use our personalities and use every aspect of our personalities to glorify God. That's loving God with all our soul. And again, it can sometimes be a challenge. This week we're going to explore loving the Lord with all our mind. All right? And before we do that, will you stand with me as we read our scripture verse? And it's just, again, one verse. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. It says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to read it, to consider it, to apply it in our lives. And we pray that you would speak to our hearts this day, that you would draw us close to you and closer to one another, that we would bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You won't have to stand up again until the end of the service when you head out the door. So, well, visitors, if you're here, we're really glad that you're here. We've got people that traveled from Missouri to be here, and people that traveled from Michigan to be here, you know. You think, I came all the way from Wakefield. That ain't nothing, is it, you know. This morning we're focusing on that phrase, with all my, with all your mind, with all your mind. And we're going to focus on two words. Each week we've kind of taken one of the main words and then some of the minor words, but the reality is in Scripture there are no minor words. Every word is there on purpose and every word is there for a purpose, right? All right. We're going to begin looking at this phrase with the first word, with. Now we say with all the time. You know, I, do you want uh, fries with that shape, right? Do you want ketchup with that? Do you want this with that? With, 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 we say it all the time. And it's sometimes by using it all the time, um, we lose some of the appreciation for the word. In fact, the word with here, uh, it has been described as the most under-translated preposition in Greek. Now I realize that most of you go, and so what? You know? And they go on to say that because it's under-translated, it can sometimes be a little mis mistranslated or misunderstood, I guess is a better way of understanding it. Uh, because, you know, when we have our prepositions, you know, on, in, with, by, you know, sometimes we use them interchangeably. But this word with is a fascinating word because it has two layers to it. Now, I don't know about you, but I like things with two layers. Uh, whether it's uh, a double cheeseburger, you know, when there's two layers of beef and that wonderful cheese in between, you know, or a layer cake, and, you know, you can't really have a two-layer cake. You normally have to have at least three layers to make it even worthwhile, right? All right? But there's two layers to this. Two ideas in one word. 
And so we're going to talk a little bit about that first, because the first part of this word, with, means coming out from. All right? Coming out from. Now, so far in our sermon series, we have focused on heart and soul. Heart and soul. All right? This verse um, also includes mind and strength. So there's four different aspects, four different things that over the month we're looking at. So we've looked at heart, we've looked at soul, today we're looking at mind. And so in this command that is given to us by Jesus Christ, this word with suggests that there is something coming out from these things, from our heart, from our soul, from our mind, from our strength. And we remember from week one that what is it? What are we supposed to do with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? We're supposed to, the L word, love. Love. Now, to give us a picture, I want you to imagine it this way. And um, I asked Natalie to be prepared. So, Natalie, this is, this is what I was talking about. Are you ready? <coughs> Since I don't have any darts, I have an alternative. All right? But this is how we're going to do because the love needs to be coming out from our hearts. Ready, Natalie? Oh, oh, Mr. John? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Open wide, Patty. <laughs> oh. Elgina? Oh, oh, I almost got it. Hey, I'm not as bad a pitcher as I thought. Oh, almost bounced back. All right, so you say, why is he throwing food in the sanctuary? There's signs that specifically say no food in the sanctuary. Well, the idea is there, you know, as we love God with all our heart, we're going out. As we love God with all our soul, we're going out. With all our soul, with all our mind and our strength, those darts of love are flying out. Now, while on the one hand that is great that there's love everywhere, that is not the intention of this word. You say, what? Dion Warwick sings the song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. The idea, when he's talking about love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind, soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, whatever the order is. I'm just a pastor, I should know that. But. The idea isn't that it just is scattered everywhere. Because remember, there's two layers to this word, right? There's two layers to this word. The second layer, or the completion of the word, and the word's meaning, is the extension of the impact upon the object of the action. Ooh, what? The idea that is wrapped up in this word is that what is coming out is going to make an impact on something else. And so the word with ties what's coming out with where it's going, the object. All right? And the word with here is focusing on not only the fact that those darts are flying out, but it focuses on the fact and the command is that the love is to have an impact on something, or better yet, someone. And who is that? Who is our love supposed to impact, according to this verse? You shall love the... Lord. You shall love the... Lord. You shall love the... Lord. All right. So when we talk about this verse, while it's good to share love, yes, love each other, throw marshmallows at each other all day long, this verse ain't talking about that, all right? This verse is talking about consistently, purposely, Danny, you're going to be God. I know you've thought it many times, but just for this example, <laughs> consistently, purposefully trying to impact in our relationship with God, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, sorry, did that on purpose, you know. <laughs> to purposely aim it at God. Not just to throw it out everywhere, which yes, we're supposed to do that, but this verse, this verse, this passage, this idea, specifically relating us to God, us making an impact on God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. 
to make a point of it, to not just willy-nilly, but to make a point of it, to make a point of it. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating because this two-layered meaning in one word creates an inseparable, inseparable bond between our love and the object of our love, who is God. That's the idea in this one tiny little word. In English, it's a four-letter word. In Greek, it's a two-letter word. I'd ask Lorraine what the word was, but I don't want to put her on the spot because she's been studying Greek for about 47 years, she feels like, but... In that tiny little word. And you know, that is what is so fascinating. Those tiny little words, so often, we just jump right past them, we just look right past them, we don't stop and, and think about them and dwell upon them and meditate on them and, and take them in. But in that one tiny little word, we see so much meaning. So much meaning. And by the way, if you've got a marshmallow, you can either eat it, or you can toss it out. Or if you didn't like the song we sang this morning, throw them at my mother-in-law on the way out of church. <laughs> but there is a, a truth there, that loving God, coming from our heart, soul, mind, and strength, it is intended to be received by God. It is intended to impact Him. To impact Him. Now, if we stop and think about that for just a second, we are supposed to make an impact on God. We normally think about the impact God makes on us. God, I want this. God, I need this. God, do that. God, give me this. And in this passage, in this verse, we are reminded that it works both ways. Now, yes, you'll say, well, what does God need from us? God doesn't need anything from us. He is sufficient. He is our sufficiency. But he wants it. Make an impact. In that word, with, that's what we see is making an impact on God is what we are called to do. So the question is, well, how purposeful are we in that? How purposeful are we in our attempts to love God with dot, dot, dot? How much effort do we put into it? How much time do we take? With, it's a small world, word, but it's a two-layer word that should change the way we apply this verse in our lives. It should totally change it. Shake it up. How are we going to impact God? The second word that we're going to look at, and you know what, folks? I'm a little scared because unless I get really, really long-winded, we might get done with service early this morning. Now, I said that, and it never happens. <laughs> but that was the long point. The second point is not as long as the second, or the first, or the second point is not as long as the first point, but we'll see. But I don't got more... I got more marshmallows, but I'm not going to throw any more. The second word that we're going to look at today, we're talking about the mind. You know, we've looked at heart and soul and mind. And so far, we have explored the idea of choice uh, and using our choices to honor God. We've looked at uh, using our personal uh, uniqueness. And now we look at this where it says, love God with all your mind. Well, what does it mean? Well, as we step back again, we understand the heart. Uh, we prioritize God, we honor God with every choice. We understand the soul, that we prioritize God and honor God with every aspect of our personality. Well, in both of those statements, we find the mind. Because we understand. You know, picking songs for this morning, you know, it was, some, it was a little bit of a challenge because, um, you know, when we did heart, you know, we had all kinds of songs about the heart, and you did the soul, and there's all kinds of songs about the soul. But finding songs about the mind, it just, uh, it's not something that there's a whole bunch on. Until one day when I was sitting there, and I was thinking, and I thought we can use songs about thinking, because we think with our minds. And so that's why the first song says, I would love to tell you what I think Right? And later on, I think our closing hymn is Think About His Love. Think about His goodness. Thinking. Understanding. 
When this verse says, love God with all your mind, it's saying prioritize God, honor God through thorough reasoning. Some of you say, well, that leaves so-and-so out. No. The word carries with it an idea of a balanced conclusion. A balanced conclusion. And actually, it's fascinating. I know some of you are going to go, well, I don't really care about that. But it's fascinating. It's even what they call um, full-orbed thinking. And it's just like full-orbed thinking, whatever is that. But that's the idea of uh, kind of looking at everything from this side to that and drawing your conclusion. Looking at all the facts that we have and coming to a conclusion. That's the idea here in this word that's connected with this word of mind. That we look at what's there and we make our conclusion. We have a balanced conclusion. You know, because it's really easy. We as human beings, we love to only look at the facts that support our arguments. You know, especially if we're having an argument, you know. You know, there can be 37 things against what I'm saying, but I'll mention the three that are in favor of my argument, you know. And, of course, I want you to pay attention to the three. I don't want you to pay attention to the 37 things against me. So, but that's not balanced, you know. If we were going to go up here and we were going to have a big debate about which um, pep pop, which soda pop is better, Pepsi or Coca-Cola, how many of you think Pepsi is better? Okay. How many of you think Coca-Cola is better? You are all heathens. <laughs> I know for a fact that Pepsi is the choice of God because when we went to the Noah's Ark exhibit, they had Pepsi machines everywhere. So, but we could sit up here, you know, da 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 da, da all the arguments, da, 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 you know, and a reasonable person would say, okay, well, looking at this, we're going to draw conclusions based on the evidence, right? And I'm just kidding. If you like Coca-Cola, you're not eating. You're just a little questionable, that's all. <laughs> we see this, though, in 1 John 5.20. It says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Understanding. Balanced conclusion. Reason. In its simplest idea, when it says to love the Lord our God with all our minds, it means to prioritize Him by practicing thinking. Shocker there, I know. Now, it may sound silly, and it may be very simplistic, because, you know, today, Anything that has to do, or anyone that's had any kind of schooling, or whether elementary school or secondary school or college, you know, thinking, uh, we learn, is not really easy, is it? I like to think of it as you take a piece of the puzzle and you look at that one piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. and you look at it from this angle and you look at it from that angle and, and you look and see how it fits, you know. You've got synthesis and analysis and all that kind of stuff. Critical thinking. And the bad news is, is critical thinking and reasoning are skills that, sadly, many schools don't teach anymore. Instead, it's memorization. It's regurgitation of the facts so you can pass a test. You know, and without getting too political, this is, I know a lot of people don't like Common Core in the schools, and if you like it or don't like it, that's okay. But this is one thing about Common Core that I do like because they do emphasize more of a, a higher level thinking, a critical thinking. Not just what is the answer, but why is that the answer? And you know what? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, you know? Because that's what God does. That's what God wants. He wants us to think. God wants us to reason. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, what does he say? He says, come now and let us reason together. You know, every time I read that passage of Scripture, it goes on to say, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they are as red as crimp, like crimson, they shall be as wool. But every time I, I, I mention this verse in Scripture, I always remind us that it is not God's desire that we be robots. God wants us to be thinking. 
He doesn't want us just to regurgitate. He doesn't want us just to stand up and read the Lord's Prayer or say the Lord's Prayer. He wants it more than just regurgitation, more than just memorization, because memorization doesn't impact us. It's when we apply it. Well, how do you apply it? You've got to think about it. It's the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. And that's really this mind, you know, we think about it up here, but it's more than just here. It's both. It's internalizing it. I think sometimes when it comes to thinking in our Christian faith, we let our doubts get in the way. We think that, well, if I look too critically at the Bible, if I look too close at the Bible, if I examine the Bible too closely, and if I approach it with reason, then somehow I'm going to be left disappointed, or somehow I'm going to damage my faith, or somehow I'm going to find out oh, the Bible isn't true. That's what we think, I think, sometimes. We doubt it. But really, nothing could be further from the truth. Over and over, the Bible has been proven true. You know, they used to say, well, there really wasn't a Jesus. There really wasn't a Jesus. He was just a made-up character. And then they thought, oh, no, well, yeah, there was proof that there was a Jesus. Oh, well, they, you know, and I love that. They're, oh, no, no, no. Oh, wait, there really was? Oh, there really was? The other day, and I shouldn't mention because I don't remember which particular it was, but there was a Bible king that they said, oh, no, he didn't really exist until they found a pillar when they were doing archaeological investigation that had the guy's name on it. And this is like, oh. And, you know, I feel like it's sometimes they grasp at straws and they say, well, this couldn't happen. And, oh, it did happen. Well, no, this couldn't happen. Oh, that did. Oh, well, this person isn't real. Oh, they were. Oh, well, that couldn't. Oh, you know, because they finally they back themselves in the corner and say, well, if, if everything else in the Bible is true, then that must mean that what Jesus did for us was true, too. But we, we as Christians, we go, well, I don't want to look too closely because I might find it to be not true. And God says, dig in, folks. Investigate. It's been proven time and time again. And you know, it always amazes me. Very often, the ones that are so passionately opposed to the Bible, when they finally say, yes, I'm going to prove it's wrong for once and for all, what happens? We think of Lee Strobel, who was an investigative journalist. And he spent two years researching and studying and investigating and doing it by himself. After those two years, what was the result? He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. We hear the story of Peter Hitchens, who was a staunch atheist, and his brother Christopher Hitchens was one of, the, one of what they called the four horsemen of, of new atheism. And he was raised in it. And Peter Hitchens was so against the Bible that whatever the Bible said don't do, he did it. Whatever he was told not to do, he ran toward it. Until he did some investigating. And the Holy Spirit convicted him and he accepted Christ. Now sadly, it's not the case for everyone. Because as I mentioned, there are some people, some very well-educated people, who will refuse to accept the truth. They refuse it, and in so doing, they reject the truth, and they reject even reason. An example, and I hate to use this person's name, because I, I never want to openly criticize somebody, but somebody who's very well known, especially in our schools, is Dr. Bill Nye. Bill Nye, the science guy, you know? Just the other day, we were watching something on television, and there he popped up and was explaining you know, how this happened and how that happened. He's very educated, you know, but he doesn't accept the truth of Scripture. He's not a Christian, and he's very open about that. He doesn't accept the biblical account of creation. He doesn't accept the biblical account of Noah and the flood. And he's debated um, Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis twice about this. And I mention him for this purpose. Because he doesn't accept the biblical account of creation, the answer is then, well, then how, how were we created? How are people, how did, we, how did we end up being here? And this is what, you know, 
the educated people very often try to do, well, if the Bible isn't true, then we've got to find something that is true. And when it doesn't work, it gets more and more fanciful. So his conclusion now, what he is advancing and has for a couple years, is that humanity started as a result of aliens from Mars coming to Earth. And I sit there going, okay. You look at me and say, it's ridiculous that I would believe in a creator, but I'm just supposed to say, okay, aliens from Mars came to Earth and populated Earth. And I say, prove it. Prove it. And they can't. It goes back to the F word, faith. Rather than believe the Bible, he believes that aliens from Mars you know, and they look at Mars, and how many times have they done investigations to find proof of life on Mars and proof of life on Mars? And again, it's not that I want to criticize him, but when we say having a balanced conclusion, looking at the facts, sometimes we look at the facts and we don't like the conclusion. And that's where he was, and it is. Because again, if the Bible is true, then that means the Bible is true. And that means I need Jesus Christ. Hopefully we don't do the same thing. Hopefully we look at the word and we accept it. We don't reject the Bible. But you know, there are people that do. They reject what they disagree with. We look at it. Uh, sometimes we don't even try to understand it. We don't try to reason through it. We don't compare Scripture to Scripture. We don't look at the totality of Scripture. No, we simply say, I don't like that. I don't like God's opinion on this situation or on that situation. I don't like what the Bible says here or the Bible says there. You know, I don't like what the Bible says I'm supposed to be self-controlled. <laughs> That's not what they tell me on the commercials. It's live it up. You know, I deserve a break today, you know. That's why I'm going to start telling the deacons when they call and say, no, no, the commercial said I deserve a break, and my break starts at 8 a.m. and it goes till 8 p.m., and then I'm off the clock, so I'm just going to keep my feet up, you know. But that's what we tell ourselves. The Bible says, God says, no, we're going to be self-controlled. We say, well, I'm supposed to honor my parents, God, my parents are stupid. My parents are the stupidest, most idiotic parents there's ever been. He doesn't say, honor the parents that you agree with, does he? <laughs> now, does that always mean you have to do everything your parents say, especially young people? You know, you should do what they say unless it conflicts with Scripture. Like if your parents say, well, go to, the, go to Kears and rob it, stop by the parsonage first, you know. But if your parents say, no, you can't go to that activity, or you can't go to this activity, no, that, what goes on there, we don't agree with, we should honor them. And of course, the bad part about this, especially with my mother and father-in-law here, is that there's no expiration date on that command, is there? He doesn't say, honor your mother and father until you get married, and you have children of your own, and they're in college. No. We are supposed to continue to honor them. Of course, it's a, a commandment with promise. That we may have a long life. When we think about words like submitting and surrendering and repenting and transforming, I don't want to repent. I like the way I am. I like the things that I do. They make me feel good. But God says repent. Using our mind, loving the Lord with all our mind, means when God says, repent, I do it. I surrender. I submit. Because He is God, and I am not. When He says that we are to love and worship and adore and honor and praise Him and listen to Him, what does He mean? We're supposed to do those. When he tells me that he has expectations for me as a Christian, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, reason tells me to do it. Logic tells me to do it. 
Love tells me to do it. Loving God with all our mind. It's a command. It's a calling. It means to make God the priority in my thought processes. All of them. Ask, what does he think? What does scripture say? Not what does culture say. Not what does my neighbor say. Not what does the president say. It's not a, a call to decide whether I will or whether I won't or whether I like it or whether I don't. It is a recognition, again, that God's ways, God's thoughts are higher than mine, that he is God. It is, a, it is an, an acknowledgment that I don't always have all the answers. And you know what? I rarely have all the answers. I never have all the answers. I got a lot of questions. And I'm not always going to understand, but we thank God that we have a relationship with Him who does know it all. And our responsibility is to turn to Him, to trust in Him, to ask Him, to rely upon Him. In all our ways. And to be obedient. You know, we consider these words this morning, with and mind, two small, short, little words. But in thinking about them, we realize that God is calling us. He's calling us to demonstrate from ourselves that all of our thoughts are directed toward Him with the intent that they will impact Him, to glorify Him, to honor Him, to celebrate Him, to exalt Him, to worship Him. That's the goal. Now, it probably comes to you as no surprise that if it's hard to love God with all our heart, and if it's hard to love God with all our soul, it's also hard sometimes, well, oftentimes, to love God with all our minds. And again, that's where we, we don't let ourselves, where we let ourselves off easy and say, well, it's just going to be impossible, so I'm not even going to do it. I'm not even going to try. And that's the pitfall. That's the snare. Don't give in to that way of thinking. If this week you change one thought, it's a victory. If this week you, you take a look and say, well, what does the Bible say? What does God have to say about that? It's a victory. It moves us closer to that mind of Christ, which is our goal. But it requires action on our part, doesn't it? Are we willing to do it? Are we willing to do it? Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this chance to come together again. We thank you for your word. And even though we just looked at these two little words, Lord, what meaning there is in them. It is powerful. And we pray that we would be mindful that the lives we live can impact God, that it can demonstrate our love for Him. And we pray that with our heart, with our soul, and with our mind, we will demonstrate the love that we have for God every day. We ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to identify those areas of our lives where we need to make changes for your glory. Father, we pray too that each one of us that are, are here this morning, that we all have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that we all have accepted Him as our Lord and Savior. We pray that if there are any here that haven't yet made that choice, that the truth, the logic of your plan would hit home today, that we would all recognize that God is holy, God is perfect, but we are not. And though we may try and try and try, we will always fail in our attempts to be perfect. And because we cannot and have not been perfect, Lord, we are separated from God for all eternity and destined for a place that God did not create for humanity, a place called hell. We pray that we would recognize that God is holy, that we are not, and without something being done, that we would know and understand that we'd be doomed for hell, to hell. But... We recognize the truth that because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he sent his son Jesus, who died on the cross after living a perfect, sinless life as the son of man and son of God. He is God. And all we have to do is by grace, 
through faith accept that truth. And God keeps his promise to give us eternal life, that spiritual life, that pneuma life. Father, we pray that each and every one of us is able to say in our heart today that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We pray, too, that we would uh, do what is necessary in our lives to live a life to demonstrate that He is our Lord. We thank you, God, for how you have worked. We thank you, God, that you are working. And pray that we would always keep you a priority in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we have our hymn of invitation.